I still talk to Lacey. There's so many things I still want to say to her. I tell her that I'm so sorry this happened. I'm sorry I wasn't there to protect her when she needed to be protected. I'm sorry I didn't see Scott for who he really is and get her away from him before he could hurt her. I tell her how much I miss her, how much I wish she was still here, able to stop by or call, and how much I love her. In the second week of April, there was a big storm, a big thunderstorm in San Francisco. The Contra Costa County coroner has arrived at the scene and has now recovered the remains of the victim. The police always believed that Scott Peterson had weighted down Lacey's body with anchors that he made. But she broke free of the anchors because of the storm. On Monday, a badly decomposed adult torso was found in a marina in Richmond, California, not far from where Scott Peterson said he had been fishing at the time of Lacey's disappearance. A mile away, another grisly discovery, the body of an unborn baby boy my understanding is they're making arrangements to have the autopsy performed this evening. I knew that they were hoping to find Lacey. You know, they felt that if we had her body, then they would be able to arrest him and move forward. And I was very concerned about that, that if um, she never appeared, that maybe they wouldn't be able to arrest him. Maybe they wouldn't be able to prosecute him not enough evidence. What can you tell us about what Modesto police have gathered so far from the body? We're still trying to find out the identity of the body. And one of the key questions we're trying to answer right now is whether or not there's any relationship between the adult female and the baby male that was found from uh, two days ago. It's not knowing. It's just unbearable. He says, I came out of the Berkeley Marina, went right to that Brooks Island. There was a sign there that said no landing. I mean, he told me he was there and that's where the bodies come up. I believe it was premeditated. He planned it. When the bodies came up, what it did is it, it automatically injected a big sense of urgency in the case. I just thought we got to find Scott right now. We knew he was in San Diego at the time. Did have a tracker on his car down there. San Diego was pretty darn close to the Mexican border. Scott knew the area pretty well. I mean, that's where his parents lived. That's where he lived. So it wasn't like he was going to have to get on map quests and try and figure out a way to get to, you know, Tijuana. So I was concerned that he was going to disappear. At the end of our last episode, Lacey Peterson's autopsy concluded in Richmond, and Dr. Brian Peterson composed a summary of his findings for investigators in Modesto shortly after. Four chaotic days later, lead detective Craig Grogan slid into the back seat of his own car, exhausted but gratified, as Scott Peterson sat silently by his side in handcuffs. But the four-day drama between Lacey's autopsy and Scott's arrest is a story well-crafted for fiction, a 96-hour-long spectacle of high-speed chases, lies, strip clubs, and cash. This is Dead to Me True Crime. Detective Al Brocchini rode shotgun as his colleague Don Bueller sped north blurring the wildflowers along Interstate 5. Scott held his stoic gaze out the window. Periodically, he would adjust his dark sunglasses, awkwardly nudging them up the bridge of his nose before letting his shackled hands drop heavily back into his lap. Detective Grogan spent the seven-hour drive back to Modesto with his eyes fixed on Scott, hoping he'd have a lifetime to get used to those cuffs. <laughs> 
Dressed for a round of golf, Scott wore a navy sweatshirt over his white polo, paired with matching white shorts. But Grogan was far more interested in the unnatural tint to his hair. Scott's orange hair and goatee became a subject of intrigue as he spun several conflicting tales about how it came to be that way, all of which turned out to be false. However, the vibrant color paired ironically well with the circus-like atmosphere Scott created before his arrest. Lead investigator Craig Grogan suspected his involvement in the disappearance of his pregnant wife Lacey shortly after she vanished on Christmas Eve. The same rang true for detectives Bueller and Brocchini, along with the rest of the Modesto Police Department, and a growing percentage of the public. The Modesto PD collaborated with dozens of outside agencies, both before and after Lacey's status changed from missing person to homicide victim in March, all in pursuit of a common goal, to find Lacey Peterson dead or alive. Ultimately, they failed, leaving Lacey and her baby boy to find their own way home. Investigators focused on Scott from day one, accumulating a significant amount of circumstantial evidence within a matter of weeks. But four months and two search warrants later, he still hadn't been named a suspect. The Modesto PD found no physical proof that he'd ever killed his wife, never mind how, when, and where. They needed something tangible to seek a warrant, forensic evidence of Scott's guilt, evidence they hoped would come from Lacey herself. Suspecting he'd dumped his pregnant wife somewhere in the San Francisco Bay, several agencies launched countless searches of the water, beginning soon after she vanished. Sadly, despite monumental efforts, resources depleted and morale plummeted as spring approached, bringing the investigation to a standstill. March came to a close with no progress, and authorities reluctantly called off their search of the bay leaving Detective Grogan with few remaining options. He'd promised Lacey's family justice, but the single hair found in Scott's boat wasn't enough to pursue it, even though there was little doubt the hair belonged to Lacey. The state needs probable cause to bring charges, and pressure mounted on Grogan to find more. With the halt of the search in March, he realized they'd scraped the bottom of the barrel months ago. Dreading the thought of a nobody homicide case for Lacey and Connor, Grogan couldn't decide which was worse for the family, the diminished odds of a conviction or the heartbreak of burying an empty casket. Without their remains, the roaches would be forced to contend with both. Vivid quilts of wildflowers surrounded Modesto in early April. However, the prospect of finding Lacey's remains grew darker than ever and Sharon Roach's thoughts blackened with it. She'd given up hope of finding her daughter alive many weeks before, but Sharon lost a piece of herself when Lacey vanished, feeling her heart may never grow quiet without the chance to say goodbye. Her relentless anguish, rage, and depression often confined her to her bed, isolated by her merciless thoughts, sometimes for days at a time. Sharon's darkest fears crept ever closer as the weeks stumbled by, eventually leaving her with little choice but to face them. Maybe Lacey and Connor would never come home. Maybe the void in her heart would only deepen with every visit to their hollow grave. Maybe Grogan would find his back against the wall and Scott would walk free. Maybe she would never have peace, answers, or justice. Sharon's wounds were fresh as flowers as Lacey's birthday approached, festering as she fluttered between hatred and sorrow. Lacey Denise Rocha was born on her due date of May 4, 1975, and her mother always said she arrived right on time. Lacey Peterson found her own way back home just before the noonday sun reached its peak on the 14th of April, 21 days before her 28th birthday. She protected her son Connor two full months beyond his due date of February 10th, but they eventually became separated in the water. With the help of Michael and Belanger Luby, Connor was found on the northern coastline of Richmond on the 13th. Lacey was discovered by Elena Gonzalez and her family the following day, just 1,500 yards across the unforgiving water from her son. It'd be four long days before an official identification was made for Jane and Baby Doe, 
but Sharon never doubted who they were, heartsick by the finality of Lacey and Connor's deaths. Their recovery left no space for fantasies and visions of their safe return, and the time had come to say goodbye. Sharon was grateful for the chance, knowing it had taken a miracle just to bring them home, but it was a bittersweet thing to be thankful for. Her early searches for Lacey left Sharon dreading every step, terrified she'd be the one to find her. But the chances of anyone finding her grew so slim by early April, it had been a long while since Sharon considered Lacey's condition if she were to ever come home. Modesto Police Chief Roy Wasden will never forget Sharon's anguish when she finally did. Chief Wasden prepared to call Sharon on the afternoon of the 14th, knowing she expected him to confirm Lacey's identity and she'd drawn herself up to face the hard truth when it came. But the chief delivered a message so horrific, no amount of preparation could have kept her world from shattering all over again. Shielding her from the grisly truth wasn't an option, and Wasden felt Sharon deserved to hear it from him. But how do you tell a mother her daughter was too mutilated to identify, that her dental records are useless, that only a torso remained of her? With no way to soften the news, Wasden steeled himself as he reached for the phone. It was one of the most distressing calls he'd ever have to make. Eventually, the chief was forced to explain why DNA testing was the only option left to confirm Lacey's identity, and Sharon's legs went limp. She dropped the phone, wailing as she slid down the wall to the floor, and Wasden will never forget the sound of her ferocious grief. Even at a distance, her pain echoed through the tinny filter of the phone, and a few hours later, the chief drove across town to check on Sharon in person. She'd tucked herself away at Patty Amador's house to avoid the media earlier that day, and she was more composed by the time Wasden met her there. Ron Gransky joined them after sending his heart-wrenching prayer by the San Luis Reservoir, and Sharon's close friends, Kim Peterson and Sandy Pritchard, were still by her side. The five of them gathered in an upstairs bedroom, huddled around Sandy's desk, while Sharon called Lacey's older brother, Brent. She put her son on speakerphone, and Wasden repeated Lacey's horrid condition to the group before explaining more about the DNA testing. Lacey and Connor's tissue samples would arrive at the lab that evening, along with her hairbrush for comparison, but Wasden also required a specimen from each of her parents. I know it's Lacey, Sharon said. The chief agreed. It almost certainly was, but they needed confirmation to strengthen their case against Scott. That evening, Sharon and Dennis Rocha submitted buckle swabs for the lab, and Chief Wasden briefed them on the continued search for evidence, assuring Lacey's parents that he would face retribution for what he'd done. Connor's recovery site near Seabreeze Drive bore no evidence of note but a few interesting items were recovered from Point Isabel the day after Lacey was found. Interestingly, police had some help with their search of the dog park. Two pieces of potential evidence were found by civilians on the 15th, one of them by Alina Gonzalez. Alina's dogs led her to Lacey's remains on the rocks the morning before. Understandably, she was deeply disturbed and affected by the discovery, compelling her to return to the park, determined to help in any way she could. On the lookout for anything that could be evidence, Alina started walking. It wasn't long before she came across a black glove. She used an inside-out doggy waste bag to pick up the glove without touching it and delivered it to officers at the scene. Investigators there had already collected a black tarp that washed up overnight, and Dr. Peterson examined a bone found by an unnamed man at the park that morning. Unfortunately, we don't have Dr. Peterson's notes or further mention of the bone after his analysis. We don't even know if it was human, only that it was unrelated to the case, as were the black tarp and Alina's glove. Ultimately, no physical evidence against Scott would ever be recovered from the dog park or the mud flat, aside from Lacey and Connor themselves. Of course, authorities had no way of knowing that when they were found, and the hunt for Lacey's missing limbs and evidence connecting Scott to her death continued for months. Chief Wasden was still optimistic about the search when he spoke with Dennis and Sharon on the 14th, 
but he already knew Scott's days were numbered, whether more evidence washed up against him or not. Chief Wasden called Detective Grogan with new orders soon after his meeting with Dennis and Sharon. He wanted Scott located immediately and 24-hour surveillance put in place once he was found. The chief instructed Grogan to contact the Department of Justice for resources and to reinstate the wiretap on Scott's cell phone as soon as possible. Wasden also wanted daily updates on the status of his arrest warrant. Grogan called the California DOJ headquarters in Sacramento shortly after Lacey's autopsy began, requesting every agent they could spare to locate Scott Peterson. The California DOJ has agents based in every major city across the state, and because of Scott's recent nomadic lifestyle, they dispatched several teams throughout the valley and along the coast to track him down. Scott was far from settled during the preceding months, often staying with his parents in San Diego his half-sister in Berkeley, or the remaining friends still willing to take him in. He stayed in the Bay Area with Aaron Fritz on a few occasions and with an unnamed professor in San Luis Obispo on a few others. But on April 3rd, Scott drove six hours south from Berkeley to visit Mike Richardson and his wife in Ventura County. We know Scott came from Berkeley because he called police to report vandals downtown on April 1st. The officers who made the report knew who Scott was when they took his statement, and they faxed a summary of their interaction to Detective Grogan later that day. The fax included details about the black Ford truck he drove, along with his comments about harassment from the Modesto PD. But the officers who sent that fax must have failed to mention Scott's orange hair and matching goatee. According to his half-sister, Ann Bird, Scott switched up his hair color two or three weeks before reporting the graffiti artist on April 1st. Perhaps the officers didn't notice or Ann was mistaken about the date. Either way, Grogan testified that he didn't learn about the change until days after Lacey was found. Ann Bird lived in Berkeley and Scott still stayed with her often throughout the month of March, including the weeks after Lacey's case was reclassified as a homicide on the 5th. Days after police determined his wife was a victim of foul play, Scott woke up in Anne's loft, hungover after visiting a gay bar with a male relative, crestfallen because none of the men hit on him the night before. That may have been because his hair, goatee, and even his eyebrows were not only a sickly color of yellow-orange, but did little to hide his infamous appearance. California residents had no trouble identifying Scott Peterson by the middle of March, whatever color his hair may have been. But those who couldn't spot him in a crowd still knew his name and believed he was a killer. The only debate surrounding his guilt was what type of monster he was. Did Scott commit exoricide, meaning he killed his wife and no one else, or familicide, meaning he annihilated his family because Connor died as well? Ultimately, the question surrounds Connor's status as a victim while still in the womb a topic Sharon Rocha felt strongly about and one she would soon take to Washington, but also a factor that would directly affect Scott's charges. According to his sister, Scott didn't seem concerned with charges or much else as he checked out the nightlife in Berkeley in mid-March, continuing to drink and socialize as Sharon abandoned her last hope of finding Lacey and Connor alive. Their first genuine lead in weeks came with the rescue of Elizabeth Smart on the 12th of March, just one week after Lacey was declared a homicide victim. She was overjoyed for Elizabeth's family and inspired by her rescue from Brian Mitchell and Wanda Barzi after nine long months in captivity, but Sharon had reason to believe Mitchell and Barzi may have taken Lacey as well. She heard the creepy couple was in California in December and that Barzi carried a doll she treated like a real baby. Sharon was crushed when the cultists were ruled out, demolishing her last slim chance of ever holding her grandson or seeing Lacey smile again. Scott lusted after Anne's young babysitter, drank copious amounts of alcohol, and sought validation from both women and men in Berkeley as Sharon came to bitter terms with her reality in Modesto. Initially, Anne thought Scott's disappointment over his bland reception at the gay bar was a joke until she realized he genuinely seemed bothered by it. But rather than dig into his failed attempt to peacock at the pub, she shifted her focus to Scott's hair. Having had similar results with a home bleach kit as a teen, Anne questioned the odd color, asking her brother if he dyed it. 
He lied to her. And when Mike Richardson inquired about the color two weeks later, Scott lied to him too, this time involving a mutual friend. Mike shared a friendship with Scott for eight long years, and he and his wife cared for Lacey every bit as much as they did for Scott. They made the six-hour drive to Modesto multiple times to search for her and support him. Mike didn't know what happened to Lacey, but he wasn't ready to think the worst of his longtime friend, a man he trusted and thought he knew well. But that would all change after his wife and son were finally found, and Mike thought back on his last encounter with Scott. He noticed Scott wasn't driving his 2003 Dodge Dakota when he rang his doorbell on April 3rd, but he didn't need to ask why. Mike knew Scott knew there was a tracking device on his brand new truck and that he'd long ago given up trying to drive it. But Mike had been with Scott when camera crews descended seemingly out of nowhere, even when their location had been unplanned and unshared. Scott insisted the Modesto PD pass the tracking data to the media just to aggravate him, and Mike had to admit the timing of their appearance was certainly odd. Whether Scott was right or not, Mike couldn't say, but he wasn't at all surprised to see him driving his father's truck that day. However, Mike was surprised by Scott's odd appearance when he stepped out of the cab. He'd known Scott since their days at Cal Poly and Mike had never seen him dye his hair or grow a goatee. But on April 3rd, his old friend stood on his front step, having done both. Mike had to ask, what was up with his hair? Scott said he took a swim in the pool at Aaron Fritz's condo, and that the overchlorinated water bleached his brown hair orange. Mike took his friend at his word that day, but he would eventually realize it was but one of a great many lies Scott told. Lies that began years before his beautiful wife disappeared and reached far beyond the scope of his hair. Aaron Fritz was a mutual friend who'd known Scott even longer than Mike did. Aaron's family moved to San Diego from the Midwest just before his freshman year of high school, and Scott befriended him right away. The two stayed in touch as the years passed, and when Lacey vanished on Christmas Eve, Aaron was one of the first to arrive in Modesto to help his friend. Scott stayed at his condo a few times since distancing himself from the home he shared with Lacey in late January, but Aaron never saw him use the pool or the hot tub, and when he heard the explanation for Scott's bleached hair, he knew something was off. There was only one occasion when Scott stayed at Aaron's place without him there, one window of opportunity for Scott to take a swim without him taking notice, and that had been several weeks before his hair color changed. Mike Richardson and Aaron Fritz wouldn't see Scott again until taking the stand at his trial the following year. Aaron told the jury his swimming pool wasn't to blame, and Mike repeated Scott's lie for them, claiming the color seemed even lighter after his arrest. Aaron went on to testify for the defense during the penalty phase of Scott's trial as well, as did his parents, Paul and Conception Fritz. The state subpoenaed very few of Scott's friends and family. In fact, his father Lee appears to be the only relative forced to testify against him. But aside from the Fritzes, nearly 40 other witnesses shared their tales of Scott's compassion and generosity, hoping to sway the jury away from a death sentence. But Mike Richardson and his wife declined to speak for him in court, and the Richardsons weren't alone as they refused to aid Scott's defense. While his sister Anne was never called by the prosecution, for reasons we may explore in a future video, Jackie begged her to testify for her brother. She refused, but Scott's defense team found a way for Anne to vouch for him anyway. Anne Bird had wonderful things to say about her brother during her sole interview with Detective Grogan on the 25th of February, and Scott's defense pulled most of them out through Grogan's testimony at trial effectively turning Anne into one of Scott's most powerful character witnesses. Anne told Grogan Scott was warm, kind, courteous, and couldn't have been more in love with Lacey. The couple got along famously during their family visit to Disneyland in November, and Lacey said she'd never had a better time. Scott was excited to become a father, bonding with Anne's infant son, and pushing Lacey through the theme park in a wheelchair. Not because she was sick, weak, or in pain, but to pamper her and baby Connor. 
The wheelchair is mentioned in Anne's book, where she oddly describes it as a joke but doesn't explain the punchline. Anne insisted Lacey felt fine and was fully capable of walking, but Scott didn't want her to have to walk so far. Lacey was happy at Disneyland just as she was at Anne's wedding, their trip to Shell Beach, and the handful of other interactions she had with her new sister-in-law. Anne said Scott and Lacey were happily married, perfectly in love, and insisted there was absolutely zero chance Scott was involved with her disappearance. Then she told Grogan that four other pregnant women were missing from Northern California as well. While he would eventually consider the possibility of a serial predator, it wasn't a priority when he interviewed Anne at the end of February. However, keeping closer tabs on Scott's location was, and Grogan was far more interested in learning where he was living at the time. She refused to tell him, only willing to say that her brother was somewhere private and safe, feeling that was all Grogan and the Modesto PD needed to know. Even though Anne painted Scott in a perfect light for Detective Grogan, he didn't trust his sister enough to be honest with her, lying about the smallest of things, such as whether or not he'd intentionally dyed his hair. Two weeks after her glowing interview with Grogan, Scott used his chlorine in the pool story for the first time, on Anne. But the first version had nothing to do with Aaron Fritz. He told his sister a hotel swimming pool in Mammoth was to blame, bleaching his hair the week before during a ski trip with friends. A far cry from a visit to the community pool at Aaron's condo while he crashed on his couch. A simpler version that seems closer to the truth would eventually come out to the masses, but not until 2006, when Sharon Rocha published her book, For Lacey. In it, she claims Scott had his hair dyed at a San Diego salon in early March, days after Lacey was officially declared a homicide victim. Scott's defense would claim at trial that he changed his appearance to evade the media. Sharon's book is an excellent read and available through the link in the description box, along with several others relevant to the case. But while we're on the topic of Sharon's book, we'd like to quickly address a few comments claiming she profited from her daughter and grandson's deaths by writing it. We'd like to clarify that the proceeds from her book go directly to the Lacey and Connor Foundation. The monies are used to support nonprofit search and rescue organizations across the U.S providing funds for personnel, equipment, and training wherever the need is greatest. So far as we can tell, that arrangement still stands. Sharon Rocha gained nothing by writing her book, aside from the chance to show the world that Lacey Peterson was much more than a homicide victim. Modesto detectives made several futile attempts to contact Scott on the 14th, nearly certain the shattered woman found on the shore was his wife. When he didn't respond, they reached out to his family for help, but the Petersons claimed Scott was ignoring their calls as well. None of them had seen or spoken with their golden boy since the day before, but it's not clear if anyone thought to ask his half-sister, Anne Bird. As it happens, Scott wasn't far from Richmond when Lacey was found, but neither was Anne. She lived 12 minutes away from the crime scene, and Scott got a call from his sister as local reporters began broadcasting live from Point Isabel. Anne watched the feed from the dog park as they spoke, but something she said must have struck a chord with Scott. That was the last call he answered or made on his cell phone, and when they hung up, he raced south, in the opposite direction of his wife and son. Where was he headed in such a hurry? the one address in California police didn't know about, and the only place left that held any chance for him to hide. Tom and Jerry Grady's house in Point Loma. Tom and Jerry are Anne's adoptive parents, and her introduction to the Peterson family is a long, strange tale told in a previous episode, as is Scott's time with her family in Berkeley. But it's been a while since we've heard from the birds, so we'll let Anne give a quick overview of her brief history with the Petersons before Lacey disappeared, along with a small sample of Scott's behavior after she vanished. Uh, and she would like to know if you and Scott have the same parents or exactly how you are related. We share the same mother, uh, so biological mother. So Jackie Peterson had four children, 
Don, myself, John, and Scott. Scott is uh, the child that she had with Lee or Pete. He goes by both names. Um, I had a different father um, and I was adopted before birth. Uh, I went straight from being born from Jackie to my parents. So I, I knew I was adopted, but didn't find them until I was in my thirties. But then you were reunited with your biological mother. And, Correct. Uh, also with Scott at some point. Correct. And, and I thought Scott and Lacey were a really neat couple and I just absolutely adored Lacey. She was something else. So you met and, and spent time with both the Scott and Lacey. Yeah, we went on a few vacations together and we're trying to get to know each other. The behavior that I witnessed from Scott after Lacey disappeared was not that of a grieving husband or a father-to-be. It was that of a roving bachelor. A man not looking for caring about his missing pregnant wife, but a man who was more interested in our attractive babysitter and portraying himself as a single man. Uh, Anne, you were living in Berkeley at the time Scott stayed with you. Correct. Um, do you have any more specific examples of his behavior during that time that alarmed you? Uh, you know, he was uh, over at our house and at the time I had no clue. Uh, I, I thought he was looking for his missing wife, um, but he was went to the store and got cocktail mix to make something called sex teenies and he was serving them to our babysitter and I it things just started to trigger after that and just the lack of interest in looking for Lacey was um, very apparent and that's it, it took me a while to kind of put these little pieces together uh, you know because they say people grieve differently or you know don't know what to do in strange situations so I just kind of watched you know, things layer up. And then I, I started thinking something's really not right here. Now you said he served a cocktail to your babysitter. Uh, did, did you say the cocktail was named Sextini? Correct. And that's what yeah. he told you? Yes. Okay. And what, yeah. in addition to that, was there anything else that was inappropriate with the babysitter? No, uh, I think he was heavily flirting with her. Uh, she had a boyfriend and I think was a little alarmed and I was alarmed altogether because I, you know, we had two small kids at the time. And so I just, you know, was paying more attention to them and I didn't really know what was all happening until it was unfolding in front of me. Anne's husband, Tim, made it clear he didn't want Scott near his home or his two small boys two full months before he began flirting with their babysitter, but Anne ignored his wishes. She secretly gave Scott a key to their house despite Tim's concerns, and as the months drew on, it became clear Anne wasn't willing to abandon her brother, guilty or not. Scott remained a large part of her life until long after his arrest, as did their mother, Jackie who drew closer to Anne than ever before. As a matter of fact, once Scott was behind bars, their mother's clingy behavior pushed him to take action. Fed up with his wife playing the role of Jackie's therapist, Tim made a bold move, forcefully distancing Anne from Scott, Jackie, and the nightmare her birth family brought into their lives. We'll discuss the measures he took to push the Petersons away from his family during our next episode. But Tim Bird began purposefully avoiding his brother-in-law when he learned about Amber Fry, often urging his wife to do the same. But Anne seemed to take an opposite approach. She and Scott drank wine, watched murders she wrote, and discussed the news coverage on Lacey's case. But their time and alcohol consumption together compounded during a three-day road trip to San Diego in early April. They had shared countless bottles of wine in Berkeley since he moved in, but their drinking sailed to greater heights when Anne took Scott bar hopping with her friends in Point Loma. The point of the trip was to visit her parents, 
but they spent a good deal of their time at the bar or sleeping it off the next day. She drove 16 hours to get there and back with only Scott and her two young boys in the car, less than two weeks before his arrest. Anne would go on to write a book full of implications about her murderous brother, but the actions she took with Scott seemed to conflict with the words she wrote, and they remained close long after he was arrested and charged, at least so far as Scott knew. We'll hear more about Anne's letters and visits to the county jail, as well as her book deal during our next episode. But in 2020, she switched up her timeline a bit. It's hard to forget the story Anne relayed about Scott and Lacey's walk through the cemetery in Mendocino. She said the creepy tale made her realize that Lacey was never coming home, and that was when she knew Scott was guilty. But Anne had a different version during her interview with Gloria Allred in 2020 claiming it was cell phone pings that made her realize her brother was a murderer. But he was on his way to Anne's house when officers arrived at Point Isabel, a detail she failed to include in her book, and she already knew he'd driven eight hours south to her parents' house after they spoke, not from cell tower pings, but because she called him there shortly after he arrived. What was the moment when you realized that Scott killed Lacey? Uh, so when um, Lacey's body was found in the San Fr- in the Berkeley Marina or near the Berkeley Marina in the San Francisco Bay, um, I heard it on the news. It was a local news station that they found a body, and Scott was on his way to our house. And at that point, we were all starting to get nervous around him. Things were just not adding up, but he was pretty close by and turned around and left. And that was extremely telling. I believe the police said that they had pinged his cell phone near our house, going there and then away. And that was very telling. It took Anne 18 years to publicly state that Scott was headed to her house as police taped off the crime scene in Richmond. And when she finally did, she glossed over the call she made that stopped that visit. The call that sent Scott bolting to her parents' house in Point Loma. However, Anne did give a vague description of that call in her book, including a transcript of their strange conversation. The following excerpt covers Anne's brief but awkward exchange with Scott in the early afternoon on the 14th of April. Did you hear? Anne asked. They found the body of a woman in the bay. It's not Lacey, said Scott, with a sharp edge in his voice. Anne could picture the sneer of disgust on his face. They'll find out it's not Lacey and they'll just keep looking, he said. But they found a baby yesterday, said Anne. What? he snapped. His voice rose in anger. Who would do such a thing? That's terrible. Who would do such a thing? Where are you? asked Dan. About 45 minutes from your place, he said. Anne told him she was going back to watch the news, and Scott simply said okay and hung up. She did say Scott was 45 minutes from her place, but carefully avoids mentioning their planned visit, even speculating in the following chapter about whether Scott was in Berkeley or Modesto when they spoke. The conversation described in her book is also rather short and seems bizarrely out of character for the situation. Anyone else might have had a dozen questions for Scott during that call, maybe more, but not Anne. It's not clear if he already knew about the Jane Doe in Richmond or if he heard the news from his sister first, but her retelling implies Scott knew nothing about the baby found the day before. Perhaps that's why he seemed to take the call as a warning turning south immediately after they spoke, driving nearly nonstop to San Diego. In isolation, these details may seem irrelevant, but when combined with Anne's recollection of the dubious events to follow, they merely serve as a foundation for a questionable narrative. Anne undeniably provided Scott with vital resources he would use to further his plans, be it on that day or another. The only question is whether she'd been an oblivious, naive victim of circumstance or willfully acted to help her guilty brother escape justice. 
Her involvement in his attempt to escape rests solely upon the level of trust one can place in Anne Bird, beginning with her version of Scott's frantic trip to Tom and Jerry's after they spoke. According to Anne, she hadn't actually seen Scott since their trip to the same house in Point Loma the week before, because their party weekend ended with their relationship on the rocks. In fact, she said they barely spoke during the long drive back to Berkeley. But Anne must not have been too angry or suspicious of Scott because she'd given him a key to her parents' house sometime before parting ways. She and Scott were only in Point Loma for two or three days, and it doesn't seem he had much need for a key. They took her car and were together for most of the trip. Apparently Anne gave him one anyway, and Scott carried it with him over the following week, finding no use for it until she told him about the bodies in Richmond. She'd already given him a key to her own home and the Grady's cabin at Lake Arrowhead, but she never explained why Scott would need a key to Tom and Jerry's primary residence in Point Loma. His own parents lived just 20 minutes away in Solana Beach, which is a slightly shorter drive coming from Berkeley. The timing and coincidence led some to suspect Anne may have met with Scott in person before he left Berkeley to pass him the key rather than simply calling him after Lacey was found. But the second call she made to her brother that day is even more suspicious, and tangible signs of her involvement begin to pile up as we take a look through Scott's wallet during our next episode. As for her recollection of the events of the 14th, Anne claimed to have no knowledge of Scott's plan to go to Point Loma, and insists her call to the house developed out of pure happenstance. However, the timing of Scott's dash to the Grady's also lined up perfectly with Tom and Jerry's departure for Europe. Luckily enough, Anne's parents left for the airport just before he arrived, key in hand. Having the house to himself, Scott poured a glass of wine, took the bottle in tow, and got comfortable at the Grady's computer desk. The house phone rang soon after, which he had no intention of answering and ignored until the caller hung up after the second ring. He grew still for a moment, waiting for an immediate call back. When the phone rang again, he knew it was Anne. It was their secret ring, and she'd been using it to reach Scott at the Lake Arrowhead cabin for months. It was sort of a code to let him know it was her, and safe to pick up. It worked like a charm in Point Loma as well, and Scott answered for his sister right away. According to Anne, he promptly asked the same question you might be asking yourself now. How did she know he was there? In her book, Anne explains she was so upset by the bodies recovered in Richmond, she tried to reach out to her mother for comfort and called the house in Point Loma. But she remembered her mom was at the airport and hung up after exactly two rings. Anne can't explain what made her call right back, but she did, quickly enough to keep the secret ring intact which is remarkable considering she had no reason to suspect Scott would be there. But if she wanted to speak to him, why not simply call his cell phone? It worked fine when she'd called him that afternoon. Perhaps she already knew he wasn't using it. But he obviously had no issue sharing his location with his sister either, happy to answer her secret ring at the Grady's. And when Scott asked how she knew to find him there, Anne told him it was a guess. Anne also describes Scott's use of the key as a betrayal of her trust, even though she'd given it to him willingly the week before, if not that very afternoon. And she didn't bring any of her frustrations up with her brother as they spoke, not with his presence in Point Loma or his use of the key without permission, merely asking why he went to her parents' house rather than to their cabin at Lake Arrowhead. Scott told her he just started driving after they spoke in Berkeley and that he did try to get to the cabin, but his car spun out on the slick road, so he continued south. That detail might have spawned more questions from Anne because Scott rarely drove a car unless it was rented or borrowed. He typically drove a four-wheel drive truck, whether it be his, his brother's, or his father's, any of which would have made quick work of the slippery hills near the cabin but Anne didn't ask what he was driving. However, she said she knew he was lying about the cabin before even doing the math on the drive, quickly determining the detour would have been impossible for him to make, 
but again, refrain from any questioning or confrontation. For some reason, his lie about Lake Arrowhead led her to suspect Scott might flee to Mexico. She recalled the incident at the bar in Point Loma the week before when a friend spotted his pocket full of pesos and things began to click. Why make the preparations and the drive just to give up after coming so close? Anne suspected he may have been spooked by the notion of police watching the border, but claimed she never mentioned Mexico, pesos, or law enforcement during that call, and she never drew up the courage to ask if he was trying to run. That was the last time she spoke to her brother without a glass barrier between them. Anne ended their peculiar conversation by asking what he planned to do next. Scott kept things vague, saying he intended to get some rest, but his respite was soon interrupted by an unexpected visitor. Natalie walked through the front door of the Grady's house, startled to find Scott Peterson seated behind the computer desk with an open bottle of wine. Hey, he said, turning towards the door. Who are you? Natalie was a family friend, and although the two never met, she knew Scott was Anne's brother, and she also knew what he'd been accused of. In fact, she'd been watching the coverage from Richmond minutes before. I'm Natalie, she said. What are you doing? She finally asked. My taxes. It's April 14th, right? Tomorrow's tax day. You're right, said Natalie, though it must have been near midnight by then. Scott suddenly stood up and swiftly crossed the room to get very close to Natalie's face. Would you like a glass of wine? She moved back a bit and made a joke about how some people are close talkers, but he ignored it. So what are you supposed to do here? he asked. Natalie explained she was a friend of Anne's sister and she'd agreed to look after the house for the Grady's. Oddly enough, one of her tasks was to switch the lights, making it appear as if Tom and Jerry were home, in an attempt to dissuade criminals from entering their house while they were in Europe. Not that much, Natalie said. Pick up the mail and stuff. I used to feed the cat, but the cat died. Did you kill the cat? Scott asked with a grin. Natalie told him no, she hadn't killed the cat, deciding it was probably a good time to leave but not before asking how long he planned to stay. She wondered if Scott could bring in the mail, saving her a trip. He said he was unsure of his plans for the immediate future, but leaned in and said, Why don't you give me your phone number, Natalie? Excuse me? That way, he said, I'll call you and let you know when I'm leaving so you can take care of the mail. Natalie must have felt somewhat comfortable with Scott Peterson by the time she went home because she left her phone number with him. He never called, but to be fair, he was rather busy over the next few days. But according to Anne, he did save Natalie's number. Before moving on, let's get a loose handle on Anne's timeline and objectively explore her recollection of events on the 14th of April, including her retelling of Natalie's visit. Scott left Berkeley between 1 and 3 p.m., arriving in Point Loma between 9 and 11 p.m. The Grady's must have caught a late flight for their first leg to Europe because Scott was already in their house before their plane left the San Diego airport. But it also means it took Anne over eight hours to call her mother for comfort after her sister-in-law was found on the rocks in Richmond. Even if Jerry had been home to console her, she may have been asleep because Anne waited so long to call her. Things don't seem to sew up any straighter as Anne's timeline progresses, but let's have a closer look at Natalie's visit with Scott before we go further. It was a bit late to switch the lights on for security, and with the Grady's gone just a few hours, there was no need to check the mail. We've certainly determined there was no cat to feed, making Natalie's midnight visit rather odd from the start. Whatever drew her to the Grady's house that night doesn't make her interaction with Scott any less striking. Natalie, a young woman who'd never met Scott but knew the accusations against him, watched Richmond police load a body bag into the coroner's van before driving to the Grady's alone. She walked in to find an orange-haired Scott Peterson drinking wine at the computer desk in the middle of the night, with his sister in nowhere in sight. But Natalie didn't seem phased, 
So Scott being in the house alone doing his taxes hours after Tom and Jerry left was perfectly normal. She didn't ask if he had permission to be there or why Anne wasn't with him, and she definitely didn't ask why he was 500 miles away from the woman and baby found in Richmond. Natalie seems to have very little fear of Scott, staying to chat with him before leaving her phone number behind, even asking a favor of him before she left. Anne claims Scott still had her phone number in his pocket upon arrest, but that can't be verified. He had three business cards within his property, but the evidence photos make the text illegible, for the most part. We'll attempt to decipher them during our next episode, but none of the three were ever mentioned at trial, and the only handwritten document Scott didn't write himself came in the form of a letter from Amber Fry. While we can't say whether Scott was arrested with Natalie's number or not, there's a good deal more to come from Anne, beginning with her failure to contact police after her interaction with Scott on the 14th of April. The hunt for her brother dominated the news over the next three days, but Anne never called authorities in Berkeley, Modesto, or San Diego. She never told them she'd spoken with Scott twice the day Lacey was found, but she certainly never volunteered his location in Point Loma. Not after his creepy encounter with Natalie, nor when she realized he might make a run for Mexico. But she did call Jackie. When Natalie called Anne about her run-in with Scott, she immediately reached out to their mother, Jackie Peterson. Jackie sank into a weeks-long depression prior to Lacey being found, but the news of her recovery returned a bit of the spark and anger into her chats with Anne who viewed the change as progress, or at least a step closer to normal, for her birth mother. Jackie ranted for a while after hearing about Natalie, telling Anne how wrong everyone was about Scott. He was far too sweet to be capable of such a vicious thing, and only a wicked person would do something so wretched, reminding Anne for the umpteenth time that Scott was not an evil person. Jackie also said the Rochas were trying to frame Scott, that the Modesto PD botched the investigation, and that the media was using Lacey's case to boost ratings. While Jackie may have been on to something with that last thought, Anne stayed carefully neutral with her response, simply pointing out how terrible the situation was. She'd grown accustomed to providing Jackie with noncommittal answers over the past several weeks, keeping her doubts about Scott private without resorting to blatant falsehoods. But she used the break in conversation to change the subject finally voicing her concerns about the bodies found in Richmond, and Jackie didn't want to hear a word of it. Still days away from a positive ID, Jackie remained adamant the bodies couldn't possibly belong to her daughter-in-law and grandson. It's not Lacey and Connor, she said. What we have to do is think about Scott. We have to protect Scott. But Jackie couldn't do much to protect her boy if she didn't know where he was which is exactly what she told Sharon Rocher the following day. After weeks of no contact, Sharon tried to reach Scott on the morning of the 15th. She kept her tone measured and even as she left her last message for her son-in-law. Scott, this is Sharon. You need to come home immediately. She likely resisted the urge to scream at him, hoping he'd be more inclined to call her back. But he never did, and a few hours later, she called Jackie. Scott's mother said she hadn't seen or heard from her son since two days before and had no idea where he was. In fact, Jackie told her Scott usually called every day and she'd grown worried after not hearing from him the night before. Sharon didn't much care whether Jackie was worried. It was all she could do to stay civil after everything had transpired. They found two bodies, she said. Well, said Jackie, I'm 95% certain it's not Lacey telling Sharon the coroner said there was no maternity clothes on the woman found. Sharon grew more frustrated by the minute. Well, I'm 100% certain it is Lacey, telling Jackie she must have watched a different coroner because the one she saw didn't give details. Sharon was livid over Jackie's unwavering denial, especially after the overwhelming evidence that Scott was responsible for her own grandson's demise. She knew Scott's mother would never see the truth, regardless of what he may have done, because she couldn't handle his disgrace. But Sharon didn't have the luxury of denial. She'd been forced to deal with the pain of Scott's guilt along with Lacey and Connor's deaths, and felt Jackie should have to face that torment as well. 
They were gone forever, and her son bore the blame. Yet Jackie refused to acknowledge Scott's wrongdoing through any of it, not even where it concerned his admitted affair with Amber Fry. Jackie and Lee Peterson continued to minimize Scott's involvement with Amber in the media, downplaying their relationship and characterizing their connection as a one-night stand during more than one interview. Sharon knew better after speaking with Amber herself, and his parents' attempts to diminish Scott's intentions with his lover were especially insulting for Lacey's mother to hear. Sharon ended her call with Jackie in frustration, and the two didn't speak again until Scott's arraignment. It's not clear if Jackie knew he was in Point Loma when she spoke to Sharon that morning, but thanks to Anne, we know both were aware of his location by the end of the day on the 15th. Unfortunately, both women kept the information to themselves, forcing law enforcement to cast a net over half the state to find Scott. Thankfully, Detective Grogan wouldn't need Anne and Jackie in order to track him to San Diego, because Scott accidentally gave up his own location the next day. But by sunrise on the 15th, Grogan and his men in Modesto already had a good start on their long-standing plan to arrest Scott. Chief Wasden coordinated a strategy with Grogan months before, mapping out every move they would make if and when Lacey was found. They'd been prepared and expecting to recover her remains since early January, if not sooner, and each man on Grogan's team knew what his role would be when the call came in. But it never did, and the dust settled on their plan months before. By early April, Grogan had completely given up on any chance they might have to employ it, but switching his view of Lacey's case to a nobody homicide wasn't pleasant or easy, and he began grasping at straws the week before she was found. Grogan called it expanding the investigation, but at this late stage, his search of the VICAP database on the 8th of April seems more like a last resort. The FBI's Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, or VICAP, maintains the largest investigative repository of major violent crime cases in the U.S. It's designed to collect and analyze information about homicides, intimate assaults, and other violent crimes involving missing persons and unidentified victims. Grogan was hoping to find a serial offender among the solved and unsolved cases involving pregnant women, hoping to cast a wider net for suspects other than Scott. Arguably, this type of query should have run early in the investigation as a methodical step to eliminate other suspects, rather than a last-ditch effort when the search for Lacey hit a wall. But that may have been because Grogan knew it was a shot in the dark, and one he only took when her absence forced his hand. Or, perhaps Grogan's interview with San Francisco medical examiner Dr. Boyd Stevens caused him to rethink the case. After all, several of the points made by the doctor on the 2nd of April didn't line up with Lacey being wrapped in a tarp or successfully weighted down by such small anchors, two key elements of his theory surrounding Scott's guilt. Maybe Grogan began to wonder if Lacey couldn't be found in the bay because she'd never been put there. Perhaps he questioned Scott's guilt just days before his wife and son were found, sending him to the VICAP database for other suspects. While anything's possible, Grogan's search for a serial predator was more likely a sign of desperation after the MPD received a false confession to Lacey's murder at the end of March. As the last search of the bay failed to recover Lacey's remains, an unnamed man called Modesto PD headquarters, claiming he'd been the one to kidnap and kill her. Grogan immediately began to hunt for a connection between Lacey and the caller, while other officers vetted his story. But Grogan found nothing. The man's statement didn't line up with the facts of the case, and the timeline was impossible. When investigators realized he'd never met Lacey and was nowhere near Modesto on Christmas Eve, they dismissed his confession as false. Grogan later learned the man was confined to a mental hospital on the East Coast, and his search of the VICAP database was a dead end as well, producing no new leads or suspects. Detective Grogan was in a tight corner, knowing it'd be a hard push to incarcerate Scott on a no-body homicide case with the little evidence they had against him. Corpus delecti is a common law Latin phrase that literally translates to body of the crime or body of the offense. The phrase generally refers to the principle that no one should be convicted of a crime without sufficient evidence that a crime actually occurred meaning concrete evidence such as a corpse, must be produced to bring a charge of murder, 
Of course, no body homicides can be tried in court with sufficient alternative evidence. And interestingly enough, they have a larger conviction rate once they make it in front of a judge or jury. The problem is securing enough evidence to get them there. There have been just 95 successful no-body homicide convictions in the U.S. since 1819, and as of January 2024, Kristen Smart remains the most recent victim on that list. Scott was briefly accused of killing Kristen because they both attended Cal Poly in the spring of 1996. But the hyped-up serial killer allegation turned out to be a simple game of dirty pool by the media. Police in San Luis Obispo knew Scott Peterson didn't kill Kristen Smart because they already knew who did. They'd known who murdered Kristen for years by the time Lacey disappeared, but without her remains, never had enough evidence to prove it. She vanished after a campus party on May 25th, around the same time Lacey met Scott at the Pacific Cafe, but he'd never met Kristen, and a different creepy guy walked her back to her dorm that spring night. The last person to see Kristen alive was Paul Flores, who had a black eye and scratches on his face when police interviewed him several days later. Even though Flores lied about his injuries and went on to populate his own list of circumstantial evidence, without Kristen's body, it took 26 years to bring him to justice. Chris Lambert released a podcast on Kristen's case in 2019. Lambert's series, Your Own Backyard, was so well-researched, written, and presented Kristen's story would eventually reach millions. The surge of interest resulted in several new witness statements to police, statements that led to search warrants for both Paul Flores and his father, Ruben. Apparently, Paul used his two and a half decades of freedom to record himself assaulting unconscious women at his home, and that's where police found the tapes in 2020. Paul was charged with first-degree homicide during the commission of an intimate assault, and his father, Reuben, was accused of helping him cover it up. Police suspected Paul's father not only moved her body, but buried Kristen in his own backyard, reaching beyond the pale to protect his murderous son. A search warrant in early 2021 revealed an anomaly roughly the size of a body under Reuben's deck. When serological testing confirmed traces of blood in the soil, Reuben was charged as an accessory after the fact. Father and son shared a trial but had separate juries, and of course, Paul and Reuben each had their own defense teams. At some point, Paul's attorney attempted to call Scott Peterson from his prison cell to testify as an alternate suspect, but the judge denied the charade. 26 long years after Kristen disappeared, the Smart family traveled to a courtroom in Monterey County. On October 18, 2022, Paul Flores was convicted of Kristen's murder. Her loved ones watched on as his father, Reuben, was acquitted of all charges the same afternoon. Kristen's father gave a clear statement to the press after the verdicts were read. The smarts found comfort knowing Paul was no longer a threat to women, but nothing would ever bring an end to their sorrow. The search for Kristen remains active, but as of October 2022, she will forever remain the 95th unrecovered homicide victim to see justice and over 200 years. The following explanation from the FBI offers an excellent summary of the evidentiary issues facing Grogan and the district attorney before Lacey and Connor were found. Quote, a no-body homicide prosecution seems similar to other murder prosecutions, except the prosecutor must demonstrate the likelihood that the victim is no longer alive. This often proves a difficult but not impossible prosecutorial challenge. In a homicide case, the corpus delecti, which is the element of the offense, consists of proof that an unlawful death has occurred. The body itself proves the best evidence of an unlawful death. However, other ways exist to determine that a person died. Many homicide prosecutors often base their case on circumstantial evidence. They must establish that, one, the victim died, two, that the person was murdered, three, their approximate time of death, four, the location of the crime, and five, the person responsible for the murder. End quote. The outlook was bleak at the beginning of April. Grogan had no solid proof Lacey was even dead, let alone murdered. All he had was an unfaithful Scott Peterson on a suspicious fishing trip when she vanished. The forensics consisted of a single hair in his boat, 
albeit amidst a sea of red flags, it wasn't enough for an arrest, never mind a conviction. But Lacey always did have impeccable timing and a wonderful habit of showing up just when you needed her most. When she and Connor arrived on the coastline in Richmond, the entire Modesto Police Department was ready and waiting for her. Chief Wasden blew the dust off their plan, sending Detectives Evers and Hendy to the coast, while Grogan, Bueller, and Burkini stayed in Modesto to prepare Scott's arrest warrant. Oddly enough, much of the probable cause for Scott's first-degree murder charges would come from the medical examiner, even though the doctor never ruled either death a homicide. Dr. Brian Peterson called Detective Grogan well after dark on the 14th of April. Both men were over 16 hours into what must have been a dreadfully taxing workday for them both. Having performed autopsies on Lacey and Connor that day in Richmond, Dr. Peterson knew his findings were crucial to the case, and Grogan waited anxiously in Modesto for his report. As a reference for the detective, the pathologist began with Lacey's case number, should investigators need to follow up. The coroner's office registered Lacey as Jane Doe number 0808, and he'd left copious notes for law enforcement in her file should Grogan need them. While Lacey was officially unidentified during her autopsy, there'd been little doubt about who she was when she was found on the shoreline, and several elements of the pathologist's exam merely confirmed what Grogan already knew. Dr. Peterson verified the female fell within Lacey's age range, and the anthropologist concluded she'd been in the water for three to six months, lining up nicely with Lacey's disappearance on Christmas Eve. Her uterus showed clear and recent evidence of late-term pregnancy but was empty, with no signs of childbirth found on the cervix or birth canal. Connor, or Baby Doe, number 0799, became separated from Lacey after decomposition led to a tear at the top of her uterus. He'd only been in the water alone for a few days before Michael Luby's dog found him on the 13th. Lacey and Connor spent a near equal length of time in the bay, but unlike Connor, Lacey was exposed to the brutal environment as she protected him, explaining the superior condition of his remains. Dr. Peterson concluded his summary with a description of the bra, panties, and tan maternity pants Lacey still wore, along with the length of duct tape found attached to her waistband. The tape was sent for fingerprint analysis at the lab in Ripon, along with the DNA samples from Lacey and Connor. There were barnacles on the tape, but no latent prints, and Dr. Peterson warned Grogan about the poor condition of the specimen he collected from Lacey for the lab. Her remaining muscle tissue was scarce, with just one area found deep within her right thigh still red with hemoglobin. Dr. Peterson certainly wasn't a DNA expert, but he knew the sample wasn't ideal. Grogan thanked the doctor for his extensive work that day and hung up, resting for the first time as he read over his notes from the call. The forensic evidence collected was encouraging. But Stanislaus County would have to step on Dr. Peterson's toes a bit in order to draft murder charges against Scott. While her remains obviously confirmed that Lacey was deceased, the pathologist couldn't offer proof of a homicide. There were no signs of fatal trauma and no reference to a time frame for her documented injuries. Dr. Peterson determined sea life, tidal action, and the relentless current were responsible for the significant damage to Lacey's body, and he subsequently ruled her cause of death as unknown. While he surmised that Connor's death occurred as a result of Lacey's, the doctor was left with an undetermined cause of death for him as well. But Stanislaus County officials modified Dr. Peterson's findings before Grogan took his warrant in front of a judge, changing the cause of death from unknown to homicide for both Lacey and Connor Peterson. Thanks so much for watching. As always, if you liked this episode, give it a thumbs up before you go. And if you want to hear more stories like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for notifications. Until next time, stay safe, be kind, and memento mori.